Whenever you're ready, Melissa. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, happy New Year to those who I have not yet spoken to. Um, uh, welcome to the N3C Community Forum today. Um, we're really excited to talk about uh, FASTER. So Ken Gersing is going to talk about that. Um, and then we're really excited to welcome uh, Dr. Elizabeth Olsner. Uh, and so first, um, just wanted to uh, let everybody know that we will be recording this presentation and it will be archived under the CD2H uh, YouTube channel. Um, please use the question and answer button to post your, your questions um, or uh, use the raise the hand feature for the host to unmute your microphone if you're interested in, in speaking. Um, and then for anything else, feel free to post in the chat section. Um, we did note um, from prior sessions that the Q&A from the chat um, isn't as easily accessible in the YouTube. So at the end, we'll also be putting the question and answers um, uh, on a slide. So the next slide, please. So just a quick um, update on our schedule. Um, I believe we are still looking for a January 30th presenter. We had one fall through. So if anyone's interested in presenting, please let us know. On February 6th, we're gonna have updates from the N3C Publications Committee. Um, there's been a lot of work, as you all know, uh, on that committee to, to really foster the best possible science with the best possible attribution, and then also uh, facilitating working with uh, partnering organizations such as the NHLBI funded recover program, um, as well as other sort of um, uh, institutional partners uh, requirements. And so we're very grateful uh, to the publications committee and look forward to hearing some of their thoughts about how we can foster um, even larger, more effective team science at scale. Um, on February 13th, we're going to have an update on our patient privacy preserving record linkage um, from um, the DataVant team and the Regenstrief team um, uh, with Jasmine and Sean. Um, I'm really excited especially to hear those updates and, and present them to you all because um, there's a lot more different data resources that have been implemented through the PPRL technology and more institutions have recently signed on to those activities. And so that's really a, a huge asset um, and enhancement uh, to the core N3C EHR data set. Uh, then we'll have a holiday on February 20th, President's Day. My birthday is George Washington's birthday, so I always take extra care with celebrating President's Day. Um, and then on February 27th, um, we're going to have um, Andrew Sutherland, Johanna Lumba, Indika, um, I'm going to butcher her name, sorry, um, Malawaraichi and Sarah Ratcliffe talk about increased stroke severity and mortality in patients with SARS-CoV-2 infection um, and looking forward to, to hearing about that. Next slide. So uh, we always present updated statistics um, every forum. So um, as of to date, we have 77 um, sort of quote sites that have signed on. Um, the, the sites represents data transfer agreements, not underlying clinical institutions, which I believe we're up over 230 institutions now, representing 17.6 million um, persons. Um, uh, with 1.1 billion visits. So it's, um, as far as we know, still the largest publicly available national limited, uh, HIPAA limited data set in US history. And it's a testament to all of you uh, to make that possible and to make the data useful for all to use for research. And you can find uh, additional resources and statistics on our dashboard. And the link is there at the bottom at covid.cd2h.org slash dashboard. Next slide. Okay, so we are going to hand this off now to um, Dr. Ken Gersing to talk about faster questions. Right. Um, and can you let me share? Um, yes, Ken, I'll stop sharing. I'll let you take over. Thank you. And tell me if you all can see my, my uh, slide. Yes. Yep. And I'm going to be really quick because I want to let Elizabeth talk. I just, um, you all, uh, we, we um, uh, about, oh, it really, in a lot of ways, this is, was Melissa's, uh, one of Melissa's hopes that we would figure out a way to come up with funding to, to, to be able to supply money to the community. And one of the things that we needed, um, uh, that we found that we needed it um, across the community, there were some qu public health questions that, were not typical research questions that the community, that the investigators were using. They're more policy, public health questions. And so we developed a, a funding mechanism called FASTER. And the idea is, is to have 
um, pressing questions that NCATS or somebody had had sent us. It could be all sorts of groups send us questions. It could be anywhere from the White House, which we got one on Paxlovid, or one from the CTRs, or from NCAT. It doesn't really matter, but these are questions that we really want answered. Um, what's a little unusual about Aster is a contract mechanism. So the reason I'm back on today is because we finished our first round and there were two questions or, which are in the upper right. Um, um, but we have three new questions we were posted um, by Gabe Eichmann this morning. Thank you, Dave. And um, they're open for, um, for folks to apply. They've all got the same due date, which is 215. They all are, are um, uh, going to have a single award, um, and the award is fifty thousand dollars. If you haven't, um, or if you're not familiar with the faster process, um, again, uh, the N3C website um, um, has a, a, a really nice uh, F, uh, FAQ and process how to do this. But in essence, you all will you'll you'll see one of the questions that you're interested in, and um, you'll go to the N3C site, and you'll see at the homepage public health proposals. You'll click on that button, and you'll pick the question that you want. Just the three that are that are now posted. There are four boxes to fill out. You'll fill out the boxes, and you will submit that. And then it will be reviewed by the what we call the faster DAC, where basically we're saying, you know, is this proposal what you're doing um, able to answer the question that we're interested in? And if you are one of the groups that are chosen, you'll be contacted by, um, uh, we, we, the NIH, um, have contracted with a company called Axel, and they will reach out to you. And to, in order to finish your application, because this is a contract, you will contract with your institution. And once you have contracted with your institution, and that is, that is in process, then you can apply, finish the application, which includes submitting your IRB. Now, this is a change from the first round. In the first round, um, you could put in your adaptation and your, your IRB initially, but the reason we changed it is because people said appropriately, why should I get an IRB if I'm not gonna be awarded? So we kind of split it into two processes. So when you return now, you'll see the question and you'll see that Melissa had applied for this last one. You'll double click on it. And you'll just be able to finish up your attestation, upload your IRB determination, and add collaborators um, if you want. So the big announcement is that there's just been a change that, that you were splitting the application part separate from your submitting the IRB letter determination in order to save the community the work to go to their IRB. And the other important thing is there's three new questions and um, they're open for um, people to apply now. So please do. We're pretty excited. Last time we had well over 30 applications and we hope you guys will apply um, for, for these three new questions. The just FYI, the two questions that were submitted last time are both contracts have been finished and um, those people are being provisioned their workspace now. Um, so um, I hope that I hope that's helpful. If you have any questions, um, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out to the N3C, and, and we will be happy to answer them. And I'll, I'll stop right there. And Elizabeth, thank you for letting me steal your time. Thank you. Um, it's not stealing. I'm uh, delighted to have been invited to speak to you all. So thank you for joining. And I'm going to pull up some slides. Um, I want to make sure that if there are questions, which I hope there are, we'll have time to address them. So I might speed through parts of this, uh, please do reach out uh, either during this presentation or feel free to, to email me uh, offline if you see any collaborations here, because that is the name of the game. This is about the collaborative cohort of cohorts for COVID-19 research, um, or C4R. It's funded by the Connects program. Um, I am the contact PI, and my multiple PI is Graham Barr. We are from Columbia University Medical Center in New York. And um, we think that C4R is a really complementary research 
resource uh, with respect to clinical and EMR based resources. So we hope that you agree that uh, there are a lot of complementary opportunities here. And uh, we would love to work more with N3C uh, and all of you to, to answer questions from different perspectives. So with that, uh, the brief agenda for what I'll go over today is uh, our study objectives and the key issues that we have tried to face head on, our basic study design, data collection to date, and what we think are key opportunities for research. So starting at the very beginning, the main objectives of C4R are to support robust epidemiologic research on the health impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on the US general population with a particular focus on cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, neurocognitive function, and social determinants of health. So we are aiming to build resources to study pretty fundamental questions to COVID-19 epidemiology, including how pre-COVID health relates to COVID illnesses. So how do pre-existing health conditions affect risk of severe or prolonged COVID-related illness? We are interested in how COVID illness is related to post-COVID health. And more broadly, we are interested in supporting research into how the pandemic period has affected health-related behaviors and non-COVID health outcomes. So whenever you set up to do epidemiology, uh, there are some classic issues that you need to contend with. I've put a little short list on the side here, which is not exhaustive, but there are issues of obviously misclassification, confounding, selection, collider and recall biases. So I've included just a few examples of how these issues are particularly relevant to covert observational research. As you may know, uh, in terms of misclassification issues, there was some confusion very early in the pandemic around the role of smoking with respect to risk of severe COVID. There were some early reports suggesting that among the severe COVID cases, there weren't that many smokers. Uh, so perhaps uh, smoking was protective for severe COVID-19, which seemed counterintuitive. That didn't stop a lot of news outlets from promoting this very um, controversial idea. And what came to light through some excellent articles that I've cited here is that what some of these studies did was they asked patients if they were uh, smoking and then they classified them as either smoking or not smoking. And when some patients were too sick to say whether they were smoking because they were intubated, for example, they were classified as unknown smoking status. And in the analyses, they were combined with the never smokers. So the referent group of the never smokers included people who were too sick to talk about their smoking history. And this is just one example of how um, a type of uh, absence of confounder data can lead to massive uh, errors in the interpretation of results uh, with these public health, uh, potential public health harms with people misunderstanding the meaning of the results and possibly making um, dangerous decisions based on them. Another classic problem in epidemiology is confounding or uh, having covariates that are common causes of your exposure of interest and your outcome, as we all know. Um, and the real problem is always uncontrolled, unmeasured confounding. So many studies we know have collected a lot of data, but there are missing pieces that could be very influential um, to understanding the actual relationships that we want to explore. Uh, so this is another reason why we really need to be very careful about trying to measure all the potential confounders across all of our groups. Because if we only have measured confounders in certain groups, we also lead into issues of selection bias uh, and even collider bias. So one issue that was described, I think, really well in uh, Nature Community's paper in 2020 is how sometimes when we limit our data to uh, cases of hospitalization or testing, we can actually condition on colliders. Uh, and this not only causes issues with generalizability from our samples, so when we're studying only a subset, uh, that sub subset might not have generalizable findings to the rest of the population, but we also can actually induce associations between things that are associated uh, with the selection factor or the collider. So this little example, uh, directed acyclic graph here, shows how if frailty predisposes to hospitalization and ACE inhibitors predispose to hospitalization, you can actually induce associations between frailty and ACE inhibitors that are not there. Uh, and so this is a common issue that is uh, very common when we try to analyze health data for an illness such as COVID-19. 
And another classic issue, of course, is recall bias. So uh, this is just one example I liked about recall bias during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, they actually asked people how their sleep was faring during the COVID lockdowns. And people uh, reported that their sleep had fallen apart, that they were really not sleeping as well as they had prior to the pandemic. But when they actually looked back and they, they looked at records of how the participants had reported their sleep before COVID-19 arrived, uh, they saw that many people were actually sleeping better during the lockdowns than they had uh, actually been sleeping prior to the lockdown. So the results differed completely based on whether you were asking the participants to look back in their own history and recall how they felt uh, versus if you looked at what the participant had said in the past uh, before this new this new exposure had occurred. So that's one, I think, uh, sort of personal example that maybe some of us can relate to. Um, but it really has major effects, obviously, as we try to understand PASC, uh, post-acute sequelae of COVID-19. This is um, some results from a very early and influential study of uh, COVID survivors in Wuhan, where they saw that the uh, survivors of COVID were reporting fatigue, muscle weakness, sleep difficulties, anxiety, and depression. And these are obviously very common complaints in the general population and obviously uh, quite subject to recall biases. I just gave you an example of how sleep might be something that's difficult to recall well before a particular uh, exposure or life change. In Wuhan, they also noticed that there were some objective findings in the survivors like low DLCO and abnormalities on lung CT. And the issue here was also that they didn't have pre-COVID DLCO values for these individuals. They didn't have pre-COVID CT data on all these individuals, making it really challenging between the recall bias and the lack of measurements to disentangle antecedent risk factors for more severe COVID disease versus sequelae of that more severe COVID disease. So we really helps, hope that C4R is building some resources to assist with these tricky issues. Um, this is just a little bit of a summary uh, play by play of how C4R minimizes some of these classic observational study biases ver via its longitudinal meta cohort study design. So in terms of looking at questions of how pre-existing health conditions might affect risk of severe or prolonged COVID illness, we have comprehensive pre-pandemic deep phenotyping via the cohort follow-up, which reduces recall and information biases and provides that additional data on pre-COVID health, including among people who had no clinical disease. So including people who thought they were healthy and maybe had preclinical lung disease, preclinical heart disease that wouldn't have shown up on standard clinic-based testing because you wouldn't have an indication to order it. Um, we also have near complete ascertainment of COVID related outcomes across C4R, which decreases some of the diagnostic biases around who accesses testing uh, and clinic based care. We have longitudinal follow up across multiple health domains. And I'll show you, we actually have ongoing phenotyping of participants, really helping with those pre COVID, post COVID comparisons so that we can disentangle the risk factors from the sequelae. And this is all within a diverse general population-based sample that includes persons with limited access to healthcare. So we think that uh, by having this target population that was set up pre-COVID, we have an opportunity to reduce survival biases and referral biases that can affect other types of COVID research. And as I said, again, this is to provide a complementary view into some of the questions we want to answer via the totality of our resources to do observational epidemiology of COVID-19. So, let me give a few more details on the study design for C4R. We bring together 14 NIH funded cohorts, including eight cohorts that were originally designed to look at cardiovascular disease in sort of a general population-based design. We have four cohorts that are really focused on pulmonary diseases and they include disease-based studies of COPD, asthma, and interstitial lung disease. We also have two cohorts that are primarily focused on neurocognitive outcomes, uh, looking at stroke and dementia. So we bring all these cohorts together and what that provides is a geographically and sociodemographically diverse target population from across the country. So there's this figure on the left. You see that we do have a bit more concentration on the coasts and in bigger cities, but we have participants in all uh, 50 US states. We also have, uh, large numbers of participants in different race ethnic groups. About 50% are non-Hispanic whites. About uh, in the target population, we had about a quarter uh, Hispanic Latino and more uh, non-Hispanic black participants, but I'll show you how uh, our participation has 
actually worked out. We have a lot of diversity, but it has shifted slightly in terms of this distribution. We also have a number of American Indian Alaskan natives via participation of the Strong Heart Study. Uh, and our smallest uh, group here is Asian Americans. Our cohorts here have been following up their participants for up to 50 years. So really uh, the cohorts have a big look back period for their participants going back as far as 1971. Um, this is a very uh, busy image and you can look at this in more detail uh, in the supplement to our methods paper published in the American Journal of Epidemiology. Um, the cohort names are listed up top here. Uh, and then on the y-axis are dates. So the earliest date is 1971 and the latest date here is 2025. And I put a little asterisk because I've said this is the pre-pandemic follow-up, but actually there's some pandemic follow-up going on as well in terms of the scheduled exams. So the cohorts have been doing scheduled exams shown by boxes uh, repeatedly in their participants going forward over time. Um, and all of these blue ones are actually occurring in the 2020 to 2025 period. Over that time, they've done a lot of deep phenotyping, as I mentioned, and this just shows the number of participants who had one of these deep phenotypes assessed in the decade before the pandemic. Again, details are available in our methods paper, um, and I've broken it into biomarkers, sleep and activity measures, neuro measures, cardiac measures, CT measures, and physical function. Uh, so you may have uh, issues that have pr of particular interest to you. I'll just highlight that we have blood in over 50,000. We have GWAS data genomics in almost 40,000. Uh, we have information on sleep and polysomnography. We have actigraphy. Uh, we have a lot of neurocognitive testing in uh, over 30,000 of our participants within the last 10 years. We have cardiac MRI, we have uh, lung and chest CT data in uh, over 20,000, and we have spirometry as we see here in over 30,000. So this is a real um, bank of pre-COVID deep phenotyping, which was performed in individuals regardless of their clinical status. So this was done in people who uh, were known to have a heart or a lung disease, and also in people who were not known to have a heart or a lung disease, uh, providing really interesting uh, information that is not found in those clinical databases. So in terms of our process of cross-cohort data development and analysis to address the COVID-19 crisis, uh, we started by collecting pandemic data in a standardized way with four main data uh, collection elements, a wave one questionnaire, a wave two questionnaire, events ascertainment, and a zero survey. To this, we added the pre-pandemic data that was harmonized um, in order to combine that pre-pandemic data with the pandemic data. And this really leveraged earlier efforts that we were involved in to do this to study other pre-COVID diseases. And we combine the pre-pandemic and the pandemic data to look at the epidemiology of COVID-19 using our C4 analysis commons, which I'll describe further, but it's a cloud-based uh, platform that uh, people on this call may be interested in using. So in terms of our C4R questionnaires, as I mentioned, there are two waves of them uh, administered 2020 to 2022. We actually have a few stragglers being done now. These were administered uh, in person or by phone, mail, or email or portal. And we had questions on infections, illnesses, uh, aspects of long COVID, and then how the pandemic was affecting dis different aspects of health and life, including financials, um, access to doctors, mood, uh, and, and other family uh, factors. And the questionnaire is available online, uh, including at our website, c4r-nih.org, in case you want to look at the details. We also have done events ascertainments, uh, so potentially COVID-related hospitalizations and deaths have been identified by the C4 questionnaires and by other cohort events ascertainment infrastructure because all these cohorts have a long history of collecting medical records for things like myocardial infarctions and strokes in order to adjudicate those for the large scale epi that uh, is behind a lot of our current risk calculators and uh, guidelines. We have physicians for C4R reviewing the medical records that were identified as potentially COVID related to assess if COVID-19 was really a definite or probable cause of the hospitalization. Uh, and then to grade how severe the illness was from severe to critical to fatal and to look at uh, potential complications during the event, including pneumonia, MI, stroke, PE, DVT and renal failure. Um, and this is all happening in with as a background, the fact that cohorts are continuing to identify uh, the cardiovascular and respiratory events that they have been doing for decades and continue to collect data on all-cause mortality across the entire target population. 
We have also performed a dried blood spot sero survey, DBS. This is a well-established approach, although it had never been used in C4R cohorts, so this was a bit of a leap of faith. What we did is the University of Vermont, which is our lab, put together these kits. There's a little picture here. Uh, they put together um, the cards. They put together lancets, uh, little alcohol swabs, instructions. They sent it to the participants, and then the participant used the little lancet to prick their finger, and then they dropped some blood onto this card with five spots. Uh, it looks like this at the bottom right here, and they put them in envelopes and sent them back to our laboratory in large numbers. Uh, so it's a way of remote sample collection, uh, and the sample is stable at room temperature for a long time, which is an amazing feature and allows it to serve as a biorepository for us. And we analyzed uh, those dried blood spots using a microsphere immunoassay designed by Luminex. And that provides information on uh, the amount of IgG to SARS-CoV-2 spike protein and nucleocapsid uh, in terms of median fluorescence intensity. So these are two plots just giving an example of how one of the early uh, pilots of this technology who might or might not be on the research team uh, found their antibodies to be responding to vaccination. So this is an example of repeated dried blood spot assays in one participant over time. Uh, and you see here, uh, they were basically looking at the spike protein on the top and the nucleocapsid protein on the bottom. Um, and so what happened was the person had their first vaccination and their antibodies remained quite low uh, for both nucleocapsid and for spike. And then uh, when they had their second vaccine, their spike popped up. Uh, and, and was quite high and their nucleocapsid protein remained very low. And that's because both vaccination and natural infection can lead to spike protein reactivity, um, but only natural infection uh, generates nucleocapsid protein. I always think of it as N is natural infection. Uh, and so even with the vaccine, as their spike protein was going through the roof, the nucleocapsid protein remained low. So this is providing an opportunity for us to identify exposures that may not have been recognized by participants to the natural infection, and also to index the extent of their response to that natural infection or the extent of their response to vaccination. In terms of the pre-pandemic data, our harmonization pipeline uh, is, is uh, intense. Uh, so I won't go into too much detail here, um, but you know, our basic principles are to identify key data sources through the cohorts by speaking with investigators, reviewing published literature, and again, leveraging extant consortia that have been doing this work for a while uh, to support different research questions pre-COVID. And then we bring the data together um, in the same place, do variable alignment and do data processing to make sure that we're using the same coding and that we find the least common denominator so we can create these common data elements across our 14 cohorts. And then once we have the data ready for analysis, we share it in a few different ways. The C4 analysis commons, which I'll describe to you. We also make sure that all of the cohort data coordinating centers have their data back, the harmonized data back for their own cohorts so they can do single cohort work with uh, all this data that has been collected. And then we are working on moving our data to uh, the Biodata Catalyst Connects platform as well. So in terms of the C4 analysis comments, which I've mentioned, uh, this is a resource that we developed early on with the help of the charge team, uh, which was led in large part by Bruce Pasady. So we have a C4 analysis commons agreement modeled after charge, uh, a prior consortium that was able to come up with uh, rules of the road for all these cohorts to work together collaboratively and make sure that pooled analyses were possible. Uh, in that case, it was to look for genetics and now it's for COVID-19. Um, so under this agreement, we have data from all of the C4R cohorts uploaded to the C4R enclave, uh, powered by seven bridges on Biodata Catalyst, and it's facilitating this cross-cohort collaboration, uh, as well as making sure that we have the regulated data access that is uh, important to all of us. Um, so we can go into more detail on this if you're interested, but what I really want to highlight is the data is there and ready for analysis uh, via the software, which is currently usable, including R and SAS Studio, among others. Uh, in terms of governing this massive collaborative effort, uh, I won't go through this in detail, but just wanted to highlight that uh, we have an incredible uh, structure here allowing us to bring together the 14 separate cohorts, which are really operating and implementing all of the data collection according to their standard processes. Um, and C4R is operating as an ancillary study to those. We are just adding to their existing cohorts, uh, these additional COVID data collection elements, and we are integrating uh, all of this work at Columbia University um, and you know, together with the leadership of incredible scientists from across the country who are participating actively in our subcommittees to make sure that we uh, can make the best of this incredible data that's being collected.
So now let me show you a little bit about the data that uh, has been collected so far. Um, this is data collected from April 2020 when we started hitting the ground running, free funding, uh, all the way through December 2022. So for our wave one questionnaire, we have over 45,000 uh, participants who've responded. Uh, wave two questionnaire came at least 16, six months after the wave one questionnaire and the same participants, and we have over 32,000 of those. Uh, of that group, about 30,000 completed both wave one and wave two questionnaires. So there's a very high degree of overlap there. We've been doing the COVID-19 events ascertainment uh, continuously over time. We have almost 2,000 hospitalizations and deaths believed to be due to COVID-19. Um, and our serial survey has been performed by over 17,000 of the participants. All told, we have uh, almost 50,000 participants who have at least one C4R data element, which is 113% of our original target. So we have been very excited at the enthusiasm of the participants to uh, respond to this crisis with us. In terms of the diversity of our respondents, which I sort of highlighted before, um, we break down here uh, the race ethnicity of participants responding to each of the data elements from the wave one questionnaire, wave two questionnaire, and the dried blood spot zero survey. You see that for our questionnaires, about half of our participants are non-Hispanic white, about one quarter are Hispanic Latino, and about one fifth are non-Hispanic black, with smaller percentages of Asian and American Indian Alaskan Native participants. Uh, so it's actually quite similar to our original target population with a slight enhancement of the proportion of Hispanic Latino respondents. Um, and although our percentages for American Indian Alaskan Native and Asian participants are low, obviously the raw numbers are still quite high. Um, the dried blood spot because of differences in implementation currently uh, is a higher percentage of non-Hispanic white participants, almost 70%. This is uh, expected to change for various reasons with a very large bolus of Hispanic Latino samples about to be run. This is how we think about our data when we bring in those four COVID data elements. Uh, we line up those elements according to calendar time to figure out what's happening in sequence in the participants' uh, COVID uh, exposure history. So this is a plot of 7,680 COVID infected participants. Uh, and the x-axis here is showing time from March 1st, 2020 to the present. Um, now, along this plot, each of the lines is a different one of those 7,680 people. So it's just showing what happened to this participant. Um, and it's very complicated, but I just sort of wanted to highlight how complicated it is. We can actually see this red line running through from the bottom left to the top right. That's their first COVID-19 infection. Um, so the person at the bottom left of this plot is someone who had COVID infection before March 1st, 2020. The person at the top had their first COVID infection two years into the pandemic. And so we're able to see that line of when people were infected over calendar time. Uh, we're able to see how long it took to recover. That's what that green uh, shading is. That's their recovery time from their COVID infection. You see some people recovered quickly. Some people recovered very late. Some people have recovered not at all. Um, we see this wave of blue. Those are people getting vaccinated across C4R just as vaccines were coming out. So this is when all these individuals were getting vaccinated. And all of these lines at the top part of the plot where we see this red line of infections coming after the vaccinations, those are breakthrough infections. So those are people who were infected after they were vaccinated. So you can sort of see that there's a lot of depth that we're able to get to by lining up all our data longitudinally. Um, and it, these are just some of the high level outcomes that we can define uh, so far for analysis. So on the analysis commons on the cloud, we have 49,500 people with their full data um, available of them, the 7,680 infected participants I just showed you. In that group, we have over 1,000 non-fatal COVID hospitalizations. We have uh, almost 600 COVID-related deaths. We have over 1,500 people who said it took over 30 days for them to recover from COVID-19, which is one putative definition of PASC. Uh, we have 29,000 participants who've been vaccinated against COVID at least once. We have over 1,300 post-vaccination infections, and we have 245 reinfections. Uh, we think that these data are, you know, really not reflecting 
2023 at the moment because a lot of our data collection was completed earlier in 2022. So these numbers are censored at the last data collection via the Wave 2 questionnaire. Um, and that's why these numbers might be, uh, in some cases, lower than you might expect, like the number of incident infections uh, was this number when the uh, Wave 2 questionnaire was completed in the participants. But some many of those participants have been infected uh, since that time. This is lining up the incidence of infections in C4R over calendar time, just to show that our experience really does mimic uh, what has been seen in the US general population. There was a big spike of infections early on with the wild type variant, big spike with the alpha variant in the winter 2020 to 2021. We have a smaller Delta spike and uh, the Omicron spike is here. And this is where a lot of our participants have already completed their most recent data uh, entry. And, and therefore we think we are missing a large number of Omicron uh, infections here, which is uh, something that we would love to fix. We're also doing COVID-19 events, ascertainment and adjudication. As I mentioned, these are some of the amazing players in this uh, really challenging work, including Akshaya Krishnaswamy, who's our C4R uh, project manager, Rafael Rustamov, who's been doing the majority of our adjudications of late, and Wendy Post, who is uh, chair of the event subcommittee for us. And you know what we've observed is that the number of potential COVID-related hospitalizations and deaths uh, was an order of a magnitude greater than what we had originally expected. So this was a bit of um, a challenge for us to accomplish uh, operationally because we weren't uh, expecting to have almost 2000 events like this to adjudicate over time. Nonetheless, um, all of our cohorts due to their incredible hard work and skill and experience have been able to request and obtain medical records for most of these events. Uh, so far we have uh, exceeded our operational milestones with over 1500 of the medical records requested and over 1200 records in hand to be adjudicated of which we've been able to adjudicate over 700. And the adjudication process is really interesting. Um, obviously you get different types of information when you're actually reading a medical record. And what we are seeing is we have a lot of opportunities to differentiate hospitalizations with COVID-19 with an infection present versus for COVID-19 due to COVID illness. Uh, we also are identifying discordances between ICD-based diagnoses that are on the chart and what the adjudicator is able to diagnose uh, based on the data available. And we are increasingly interested in examining these hospitalizations that are not for acute COVID-19, but that are found to be due to post-COVID conditions. And we think that that's a critical area for us all to move forward in. In terms of our zero survey, as I mentioned, there's over 17,000 dry blood spots that have been analyzed by an incredible team. These are the, some of the players uh, from University of Vermont, Mary Cushman and Russ Tracy from the Wadsworth Laboratory at New York State, Monica Parker, Linda Steyer, and Nick Mantis, uh, who are also working with ZeroNet. Um, we were delighted that 95, 96% of our samples have been analyzable. Again, this is the first time we've tried to do dry blood spots in the, co in the cohorts and the participants have done an excellent job. Um, so very few of the dried blood spots have failed. And what we've seen in the ones that we've analyzed is that we do have a very reactive cohort. So 88% of the samples were reactive for antibodies. Um, certainly not all of them were reactive for nucleocapsid antibodies. A lot of these were due to vaccinations, but this is providing really exciting data to think about exposure history and uh, immunologic response across uh, what in this group is a, is a rather older population of vaccinees. Um, so we have uh, some analyses on this point that will be presented at the AHA Epi Lifestyle Conference if any of you are there to discuss it with us. Uh, in terms of our harmonization process, this is also a huge effort being led by Pallavi Balti, who's really leading the C4 Analysis Commons development, um, Asma Sharaf and Jingyi Zhang. Uh, we have made an effort to identify the major COVID-related variables that are available in at least four cohorts and set those as our priority to harmonize. And a lot of work has been accomplished across multiple domains, which are listed here along the left, anthropometry, renal measures, cardiovascular measures, metabolic measures, pulmonary, sociodemographic, psychosocial, and other, which is a broad group. Uh, we still have many items on our queue and we're still fielding requests from investigators uh, to go and see what else we can find um, to answer their specific research questions. 
We are harmonizing uh, neurocognitive data at a very uh, large scale. This is being led by another incredible team, pictures on the right, uh, Zarina Kral and Jen Manley at Columbia, Priya Palta, Mitch Elkins, uh, and also Mohammed Havas and Suda Sashadri. Uh, so the harmonization includes neurocognitive measures from neuropsych batteries, which can take up to an hour and a half to complete in our participants. And many of the cohorts have performed longitudinally, uh, including pre and post or peri pandemic, which is an exciting research opportunity. And the group is working to harmonize all these measures across the cohorts, including across languages, uh, which is really exciting and will provide us hopefully with up to 30,000 participants to look at trajectories of neurocognitive function measured objectively and how they relate to COVID outcomes. Um, we're also harmonizing data available from pre-pandemic brain MRI across cohorts where that's available to look at various quantitative measures of clinical and preclinical brain disease. We are also supporting geospatial harmonization being led by a wonderful team, a very large team. These are just three of the leaders, Jana Marcia Pescador Jimenez and Lila Besser. Um, they've completed an inventory of all the neighborhood environment variables and are mapping and assessing the spatial extent of C4R participants. Uh, they are you know, working on a lot of different issues here to really create a foundation to look at social determinants of health uh, defined very broadly and also environmental issues. So we think this is an exciting opportunity. Um, so that brings me to other opportunities for research. Uh, I'll just reiterate, we have data available. Our cross cohort harmonized data is now available on the C4 analysis commons for anyone with an approved analysis plan. Um, we have sent harmonized data back to the cohorts. So specific cohorts can run their cohort specific analyses already, which is terrific. And we're planning to submit our most updated data that's uh, updated through December 31st, 2022 to BDC soon for more public access. Um, this means that we have COVID era variables and pre-COVID variables, uh, which I won't go and I won't list for you here, um, but we are encouraging people to think about whether they might want to uh, test any of their hypotheses in our, in our data, um, perhaps as complementary to work that they're doing in clinical databases or in other settings. We have a large number of approved C4R proposals across many, many domains, um, and we're welcoming more. So some details are available again on our website and you're most welcome to talk to me about any ideas you might have. In terms of some challenges we've faced, there are definitely differences among our cohorts uh, across all dimensions. And the big win has been that there's been such inspiring cross cohort teamwork. And that we really feel like this uh, has expanded beyond the COVID sphere um, in terms of thinking about how we can collaborate to study all aspects of public health. Uh, as a larger consortium. Um, there were clearly pandemic related operational obstacles to data collection. Uh, so many of them, you probably are well aware. Um, many, there were many staffing issues, many personnel is issues, many difficulties participants had in terms of getting to us. Um, and we have been really excited by uh, the incredible yield of our questionnaires despite these issues, and also by the success of our completely de novo dried blood spot program, uh, which may have legs to, to do other work in the cohorts in the future as we think more about remote collection options. Um, data sharing and harmonization is always very challenging. We have found the C4 analysis commons to be a really useful tool uh, for both elements of harmonization and analysis and want to continue to use it and, and really um, optimize it for to, to expedite people's work. Uh, and open it up to as many investigators as we can. There's clearly been a rapid evolution of both scientific questions around COVID as well as rapid evolution of COVID itself, uh, which makes it difficult to do uh, epidemiology in real time, especially with the cohort infrastructure. Um, nonetheless, we have been lucky to have anticipated some aspects of long COVID and included them in our questionnaires, largely due to the incredible input of very prescient scientists who are working with us. And we do have data collection covering the variant waves uh, from 2020 to 2022. We would love to have more data on more recent vari uh, variants and we hope to expand that in the future. In terms of the impact on the field, as I mentioned, uh, we have made the C4 data available to advance COVID epidemiology across multiple scientific domains. And we're maintaining that C4 infrastructure to collaborate and to build more partnerships for COVID and non-COVID science. 
Um, we think that there are opportunities to harmonize data that is currently be co being collected by the cohorts, like more brain MRIs, more chest CTs that are being done in the COVID period um, to, to support these critical pre post COVID comparisons that are really hard to do. Um, and we think that our resource would benefit from data on newer variants, therapies and vaccines and are exploring opportunities to make that possible. I'd like to thank everyone. We have over 200 investigators who have committed themselves to this effort through thick and thin. And this is just the list of members of our cohort coordinating committee that's been meeting monthly pretty much since summer 2020. Uh, and they are the ones who have led their cohorts uh, to do the data collection and to do the data harmonization and, and analysis. And uh, enough thanks cannot be given, I think, uh, in a couple of seconds. So I'll just pause there, but you can imagine. Uh, we also have an amazing Columbia team working to do the, the central work um, with some names listed here. And I already mentioned some of them on earlier slides. Um, this is a funding slide, which also has a highlight to remind me of uh, just a, a few people to specifically mention. Uh, so Graham Barr is, again, my co-PI for C4R, and Akshaya Krishnaswamy is our incredible project manager, without which this would not have been uh, possible. Uh, these are our funders, or a subgroup of our funders, NHLBI, uh, NINDS, and NIA, uh, Connects, Biodata Catalyst, and our incredible 14 cohorts. So with that, I will move to Q&A and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, um, uh, Elizabeth. This is just an amazingly huge amount of work um, and just so much to be proud of. Um, I, I have um, just a, a quick comment or question and then I see that um, uh, Ken has his hand up as well. Um, I'd love to, you know, I, I'd love just to think about two things, and this may be one of the things that Ken's about to say as well. One is, um, how do we potentially um, perform data linkage between some of the cohorts that you have in the N3C cohort, where we have a lot more, you know, kind of raw, real-world data, EHR data, but not all the sort of, you know, biomarkers and survey instruments, because we could really use some insight through those um, perspectives, but then we also have a much larger population that we're harmonizing in our context. So that was one, one question and comment. And then the second was about the data harmonization um, technologies and strategies that you're all using. And we've done a lot of that work ourselves. And we also, and on my team in particular, are leading some of that initiative in the Biodata Catalyst platform as well. And so there may be some opportunities to sort of trade um, <laughs> tales from the crypt about how to, uh, you know, how to really make that go and, and other best practices. And so we'd love to connect your data team that's been working on those activities with our harmonization team is maybe a second um, a next step or, or some other in some other venue. Absolutely. Um, your first question about linkage is a great question. It is a question that's been asked over the past few years and the answers are yet to be determined because of various um, significant privacy issues. But I think we all agree that we want to talk more about how this might be possible. Um, and so I think it is a question we need to continue to ask and, and think creatively about ideas. Uh, and we have some. So I would love to meet further and talk through some of our ideas and some of your ideas and some options to move this question forward, because I completely agree that would be a huge opportunity. Um, but challenge. Then in terms of uh, software, et cetera, to do harmonization, this is also a question that's critical. It's been asked many times, happy to share tales from the crypt. Um, we are using uh, more AI-based techniques for our imaging harmonization, for example. Um, so, so that's, again, like a slightly separate uh, avenue, which I think is important to consider and that might be more relevant to those um, deep phenotyping harmonization issues in terms of harmonizing the very core classic covariates. Um, we've been lucky that our cohorts have generally asked questions in the same way across those cohorts. So we've been pretty lucky uh, in some cases in terms of our ability to bring 
to bring those data together relatively seamlessly as common data elements. And it's been a lot of hard work, um, but and we're hoping that hard work will be something that other people won't have to do in the future, that we'll be able to share that and people are gonna be able to use it. And we can close the door on that part of the crypt and move to some of the thornier issues that uh, are ongoing challenges. That sounds wonderful. It sounds like a great, both are great opportunities for collaboration. So we'll definitely, I'll definitely follow up with you on both. Um, you wanna go ahead, Ken? Yeah, um, <laughs> Melissa, you're so funny. She did. She stole my question, just like she said she was. But I can add an. I can add a follow on uh, Elizabeth. A really nice job. I my so N three C is really wide and shallow, <laughs> you know. Uh, but and but you have I'll call it narrow and deep, and it is a great potential marriage. In the, in the linkage, we use this technology called PPRL, and we do this every week with Biodata Catalyst now, and all of us. Now, there's kind of an in-between step that we could explore, and we don't need, and we can go, we've gone all, all the way up to the Office of Science Policy on this, but we can do matches, but not exchange clinical information. And for like all of us right now, every week we get, we match their patients with our patients. We just are saying, there's, you know, of a, you know, hundred people from your side and hundred people from the other side. Fifty of them are in both. So we are allowed to because we're not really explain exchanging clinical information. We're really just saying, though we don't know who these are, the numbers match, right? So I think that might be a, a first step because you know it's the juice worth the squeeze. Um, if we just knew if there was overlap, if there's no overlap, then I, I think that you know, we, we go our separate ways. Um, but anyway, I, you know, I, we very, uh, very interested. Again, Melissa um, hit the nail on the head. I think you've done some great work. I wanted to ask you a question about just a couple of questions. The, it seems like you've got these amazing registries, which have been going on for since some of them since forever, but uh, 1971. So, um, so that is, so, but so you're bringing in the same questions and it's almost kind of like gluing them together by their clinical experience. So I'm understanding that this correctly with a unified, uh, kind of the unified questionnaire. It's really smart. My, my question for you otherwise is how have you interacted with the recover teams? Because obviously NHLBI has something to do with that, that funding or that, 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 that initiative. Yes, uh, these are all the right questions, and they all have pretty long answers that we should follow up on. I think for this linkage issue, it would be wonderful to make sure that we have um, a presentation from N3C to the C4R PIs. So we should organize that because this is the type of thing that's, uh, you know, a, a consensus effort where we need to, you know, we need to discuss it. Um, with all of the, the leaders. Um, and that I think has been one piece that, that we, in the midst of the pandemic, haven't had time to do, which is move it from people talking to me to people talking to this incredible group that I've had the honor of collaborating with. So that's something I think we should plan. Um, and then secondly, uh, you know, I think in terms of, looking at long COVID, we are very, very committed to contributing to that research and very committed to partnering with Recover um, to do that. And exactly how we will do that uh, is history that we're going to write, hopefully, in the next nine months. So um, we have some data we're already excited to analyze around long COVID, and we really want to knit together all those other pieces. And we have talked a lot with Recover about how our questionnaires relate to their questionnaires, for example. And we've been trying to use that same harmonization collaborative framework we're already using with our cohorts to, to work with Recover sites as well and see where we might be able to um, link up uh, and provide complementary uh, information um, to test out findings that they that they might be developing and recover and that we might want to um, explore in C4R and vice versa. So there are many opportunities, I'm sure, and we are really excited to work with them, however that works out. Thank you. Very much appreciated. That's terrific. Yeah. And I think there's a lot of 
survey alignment that could also happen and also potentially um, uh, validate using you all as a partner to validate our machine learning classifier for EHR data with your consented patients. Um, we would really be grateful if that was something that might be possible. So we could put that on an agenda to discuss with with you all, and I can send you some links and some papers. Um, we do have a couple comments in the in the Q and A before we um, end, so I just wanted to read those off. Um, so from Josh share Bessel. My screen to uh, Melissa was those if you okay. want to read those out. Sure, go ahead. You can go ahead and share. Um, Josh says, I don't have a question. I just want to take the opportunity to remark on what a true triumph this is. Dr. Elsner, the heroic efforts from you and your team and your colleagues are a true service to the nation and to public health. Thank you. That's lovely comment, Josh. Um, and I couldn't concur, concur more. Now a real question, um, which we have <laughs> just enough time to answer, Thank I you. think, um, uh, uh, which is uh, from Clementine. Uh, this is amazing work. Thank you, Dr. Elsner. Can you expand on the work the team has done on geospatial harmonization? Thank you. Yes, that's a key issue. I'm really, really enthusiastic about it, and I am not an expert in it. What I am is working with incredible experts in geospatial harmonization who I showed you their pictures. Um, they have started by really just asking the question, what could be done, which is a big question, actually. It sounds simple, but just figuring out what data is available across our 14 cohorts to put together and harmonize um, was the first uh, agenda item. And they have basically checked that box. They will be presenting what they found so far um, over the coming year. I can't remember the conference, but this hopefully will be forthcoming as an abstract presentation and then as a publication to really show what is available, what is possible. And then in terms of making the possible a reality, there are a lot of issues in terms of data security that we need to work through. Um, we, you, we can talk about this separately, as you can imagine. Um, the data is very uh, carefully controlled in different universities across the United States, figuring out ways in which we might be able to safely um, pool that data uh, consistent with all the original consents. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a project and we have already started on that project. We're excited about thinking through um, ways in which we can really bring these data together so we can do larger studies and so that we can also integrate new data that's coming in for geospatial data uh, as we go, because a lot of cohorts do have funded efforts to do work on um, social determinants of health using geospatial measures and also looking at um, environmental pollution uh, and other environmental issues. So really bringing all that data together so we can have data from across the United States all the states with a real broad swath of the population represented. That's a that's a dream that we have in order to advance COVID epidemiology, but obviously this has a broad applicability to epidemiology of chronic diseases that are the first love of most of our uh, investigators at C4R. We have cardiovascular epidemiologists, respiratory epidemiologists, we have, um, Environmental epidemiologists. We have we have many people who came from a broad set of backgrounds of critical chronic uh, health conditions. So we think of this work that we're doing to bring the data together as hopefully a platform for not only COVID science but to support these key questions relevant to population health uh, perennially. That's fantastic, Dr. Altner. I I I think we have some potentially complementary and synergistic um, harmonization activities in that space that maybe might be a Reese's peanut butter situation. Um, uh, so I look forward to catching up with you and we can do some brainstorming and then come up with a strategy for um, talking to uh, the C4E community. And so with with uh, without further ado, and we're at time, I'm going to go ahead and. Um, Plaud, and thank you very much for taking so much time to um, to show us what your community has been up to. Uh, I think there's just so many opportunities to work together and uh, just a really amazing work. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. And I look forward to working with some, if not all of you. And Elizabeth, Wonderful. if we can reciprocate, maybe we could do a demo for some of your team, then, then I think that that, would, that might stir the pot too. So anyway, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Take care, everybody.